Welcome, welcome everyone to episode 13, lucky number 13 of Owning Her Health podcast. This episode is sponsored by the Mind Body Brand Academy, a new 90 day micro practice accelerator to get you from thinking about you might be wanting your practice of your own as a yoga therapist, physical therapist, occupational therapist, uh, medpreneur of any kind, health entrepreneur of any kind, and in 90 days going from fear and analysis paralysis to fantastic and your first sale. So check that out in the podcast links on my Lips and Podcast Owning Her Health page as well as on Dr. Lisa Holland PT.com under the blog post for this episode. So today's episode, like I said, is special, not because it's just number 13, but it's because it is the special Valentine's Day body love episode that I'm bringing you Erin K. Jackson from Jackson Legal LLP. And the reason I picked this young maiden goddess is because her story is unique. She is the owner of, a co-owner with her husband, Jackson Legal LLP, as I mentioned, but her healthcare attorney had change into inspiring um, empathy and humanity back in healthcare, very similar to to mission of mine, really, really got me looking at her pelvic health story being the catalyst for that, and how wonderful her Inspire Santi, um, Sante um, blog post, especially her most recent one uh, that I had read before I, I recorded this, the January, the new year, near one about how invisible disabilities sometimes are, are, are so much harder than visible visibilities. All of that yumminess was on this show. In fact, it took us um, into about 10 minutes past the normal 30 minutes, so it's a little bit longer than the, than the normal podcast, but it is well worth it. So I hope that you'll join us right now for Owning Her Health. Welcome to this episode of Owning Her Health with your host, Dr. Lisa Holland, PT. Join Lisa as she starts the conversation on what it really takes to become a healthy, wealthy, and whole CEO of your life. Listen in to real talk by real lady leaders in all walks of life as they open up on personal health stories, wealth, career, and feminine abundant living. Learn how to grow by owning your body, expanding your mind, and aligning your soul with the purpose only you can pursue in this world. Happiness begins with owning her health right now. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Owning Her Health. I'm so excited to have on with me Erin Jackson, and she is a lawyer, but she's so much more. She has a wonderful personal story that I think has brought her into what she's doing right now with her um, organization and um, Inspire Santi. Is it Santi? Is that the Santé. Santé? Okay. I knew the little asterisks meant a different thing. Um, <laughs> <I feel> French. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there you go. And I should know that because my my, my real name is Lisette, Lisette. And um, I should know that. But, um, you know, she, she has a wonderful story, I think, that really kind of blends this health, wealth, only ownership story and coming from I see her as this maiden goddess taking her story into this mothering birthing her own her own business and and work and and taking all her yumminess and, and coming into her own into into that segment now so welcome so much um Erin and introduce yourself who who do you see yourself as now in this world 2017 great well thank you for having me I'm really happy to be here um, and I really feel like 2017, I was telling my husband, uh, yesterday is going to be, so it's my third year of health after recovering from a decade of chronic pelvic pain. Um, and I feel like it's really going to be the year that I make great strides in growing my nonprofit Inspire Sante, which I really founded sort of accidentally, I started blogging and started public speaking and found that people were really drawn to and moved by my personal story with pelvic pain. Um, I historically have been a pretty private person and only a couple years ago started actually telling people what was going on. Um, I had a decade of vulvar pain and that's not stuff we talk about. And I found that I spoke at the um, APTA, the Physical Therapy Association's uh, annual meeting in February in California. And a lot of the 
female physical therapist came up to me afterwards and said that this was their story. They had pelvic mm. pain. They had no idea. And so that was really powerful for me that I was reaching people who I just assumed that if this happened to them, they would know what to do about it. Especially when they're sitting in the APTA. Yeah. <laughs> I was collecting an audience. Uh, it's just, we don't talk about this stuff. And I was raised in a household where you don't talk about this stuff. And I have a lot of girlfriends who don't talk about this stuff. Right. It's as if we don't have a lot of, you know, I work with women's health and so much is like, by the way, there's a segment between your ribs and your knees that yeah. you need to start loving and owning again. It's yeah. got lots of different names. And, you know, I say it's like having a, a, a house and a room in your house and you know, it's there, but like you, ne you hardly open the door. You let other people open the door once in a while, but like, you're like, I'm not going in. You're not going to use it. You're not going to use it. <laughs> yeah. We're so uncomfortable about it. It's like something that we talk about once a year when we go for our annual. I mean, so many people were relieved when they made recommendations a few years ago. Like, you can only come every three years now. <laughs> I know. Most places, they'd be like, what are you telling me? I need to go every year. Yeah. So it's just, so this conversation sort of evolved from the APTA to um the brunch table you know mm -hmm. with your friends on saturday morning and not too long ago i was talking to a girlfriend who's in her mid-30s and she has multiple graduate degrees and i was telling her all about my story and she knows me well but at the end she says um pardon me erin but where's my vulva <laughs> right and i said this is why it's important <laughs> so um, I am a lawyer and I have a law firm, but people never invite me anywhere because of that. <laughs> um, it's really my passion for women's health that drives me. And I've sort of brought that into my law firm. We uh, create healthcare practices. And so we do nice. a really patient-centered way where I will look over and create intake forms for people and say, this would be the way to do it that wouldn't freak out, you know, a pain patient that wouldn't freak out a new mom, stuff like that. So, and that's so important because I work with the women who are trying to make those types of practices because there isn't um, a guru now out there, you know, there definitely wasn't one when I was starting out. So I was like pulling together. That's why I went into yoga because yeah. there was stuff like that in yoga and yeah. there was stuff like that in talking, you know, about chakras and, you know, yeah. things like that in a different realm. But um, we now have the wonderful, you know, science of epigenetics and quantum physics and, and, and this big word biopsychosocial and, yeah, and, I love and it. wonderful, <laughs> yeah, the things and it's bridging, it's bridging the lawyers. It's bridging the, the, you know, not just the, the doctors with the physical therapists, with the, the massage therapists, but, you know, these other industries, and especially with women, we need to come together. That's our nature, Co you know, connection, collaboration, community. That's our natural flow. That's how we're going to make that impact that people need to, to listen to. So I thank you for your work and, and being able to share that, because if you didn't share that, you wouldn't have gone and spoken on it. And so many people wouldn't, you know, maybe know and, and maybe not listen to this thing. I don't know, but it's, it's going to keep rolling. Absolutely. You know? So, you know, um, tell me a little bit about, I know you say, you know, nobody goes to my lawyer thing, but I think that they will now because <laughs> they know you're really cool with understanding them, especially the, you know, I work a lot with women health. People want to really balance their own women's health. That's why they came into it. Yeah. Um, into, you know, it wasn't a broken leg. It was, you know, a, a dysfunctional sexual relationship or a birth injury or something right. like that. And they want a career. They want a thriving career, but they have another commitment and that's at home. And whether that's, you know, their husband or their, their parents or their kids or their future kids they want, they want to create that career. So I think, you know, what you're doing there with the, there's a real outlet for that. So thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's been a so nice energy. What, would you what do you think now with your story 
tell them, let's say the guru gal inside, you know, I, I believe there's a tribe inside of us and we need to address every single one of them. And, and age kind of opens their door, but it doesn't make them step out. And, and it doesn't necessarily, you know, they don't necessarily disappear and die because we yeah. get to a certain age. We have to keep talking and collaborating with them. So what do you think now, you know, the woman you are now moving into like birthing your career and these ideas in different ways, taking that creativity, that fire you had a little bit younger, what would you turn around and maybe tell, you know, Erin 10 years ago or even 20 years ago, that, that young gal? Chill out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so much I think of, so I've met a lot of other women with pelvic pain. Um, and so many of them are so accomplished. And they have all these degrees and they have these just thriving careers. And it seems like a history of really piled on stress often links us. And, you know, I have three degrees. I graduated first in my law school class. I like thought that I had everything lined up to be just so happy, but I was never actually that happy in the moment. I was putting everything together. So one day I could be happy. Mm. Um, and my husband said to me one day, what if you get there and or what if you're just racing to sort of nowhere? Yeah. <laughs> what if you just die one day and right. you spent your whole life hoping that this will be the building blocks of being happy. So my pain was increasing through law school with the stress. And I got a fabulous job offer for after school that I accepted. I beat out 800 other applicants. Wow. Great job with a federal judge and was like, yes, you know, I'm, I've made it. <laughs> yeah, I did. And three months before the job was to start, my body made sure that I didn't take it. Um, my pain just took over to the point that I was, I ended up in a wheelchair. I couldn't wear pants, couldn't wear underwear, mm. rippling pelvic pain. So I withdrew from the job. And a few months later, we moved across the country to come home to Chicago, um, where we knew that I could get health care. And ever since then, I've rebuilt relationships with family. I've reconnected with my college girlfriends. I do yoga regularly. I just have so much more balance. Um, since I was sick, I've gained 40 pounds and I'm healthier. I mean, I was emaciated and like ghost-like and I cook and I, I mean, I just have a vibrant life now. Mm. I wish my younger self knew that my resume didn't equal my happiness. Like, right. So that, that there, I'm hearing you say like that redefinition of success. Oh, absolutely. Success is, you know, it's individual and there is not a thing that you can look externally at as that's my success because that's somebody else's or yes. that's, you know, you have to sort of just sit around. And I just did a um, post on Instagram this week on kind of a similar thing of like, you know, be careful of, um, you know, not looking around while you're doing all of these things, because, you know, you might just realize that like your simple, ordinary life is quite happy. Yeah, there's nowhere else you really need to go. And then you get this wonderful freedom of being able to choose how you'd like to use your energy. And, and somehow the money still comes and the yeah. abundance and the connections because you're authentic. It's having faith in that. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And I think that I really thought it really culminated when I was in this fancy law firm job a few years ago. I worked there for a week and realized I was miserable. The second they sent in a plant consultant <laughs> to help me select my office plant out of a catalog, um, right. where this is all this guy did. The second they did that, I said, they're doing this because I have no time to spend outdoors. And respectfully, <laughs> I decline your plant and right. I decline the job because I'm, I couldn't feel more like I'm in prison. <laughs> right. And it's funny that you say that because like, it was a very kind of empathetic thing to say, you know, I know you're going to be here, you know, 12, 15 hours, you're not going to see the light of day, but it, it makes it. And I think we have that a lot in society, um, which women, you know, we cycle. And it's beautiful we cycle um, because we really 
are sensitive, I think, to nature pulling us back. And it's a medicine. It's a medicine. It's, it's a bona fide scientific medicine. I'll give you the research now, you know? <laughs> this isn't me being the yogi on a hilltop. Um, but it's kind of like we keep inventing things as humans in the wrong directions. We keep making it, you know, easy peasy to be inhumane to ourselves. And so it does come at our, you know, some people get the jaw pain and they can't, you know, the, the, the heart attack or the, you know, the pelvic floor. It's just, it's gripping. It's a gateway into you. And, you know, we got to be listening to our bodies and honor. I love that you honor it now. Because yeah. some people in your scenario, you know, when you're so caught up into the uh, what I'm not, the not enough, you say, oh, damn it, now this thing's getting in my way. I work so hard. And they get angrier at their body. And then it reverts and gets angrier because it's, it loves you. Yeah. Every cell loves you. And it will keep trying until the day it dies to relay that. No matter how inconvenient it is in your, you know, uh, acquiring your, your external validation markers. <laughs> I've definitely had those times where I have felt really angry at my body because sometimes it doesn't prevent you from taking a job you shouldn't have, but it prevents you from going kayaking on a Saturday. Right, night. the fun you want. Yeah, but I've gone into my, I have a wonderful pelvic floor physical therapist here in Chicago. She's amazing, Sandy. Um, yeah, you're with Entropy, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I go in and see her and I don't see her regularly anymore. But she says, how cool is your body? It's protecting you. Right. It needed a break. And that flipping of it and making it empowering and making it, wow, my body's protecting me and making it so I can live the fullest life. Um, yeah. really helps, I think, counteract that anger or that frustration. Of course, because that's bringing in the joy. You know, that's that transition. Again, the reminder of adolescence. You know, adolescents are, like, really angry. It's a, but um, I don't know if you saw the um, the Disney Pixar film um, Inside Out, or was it Inside Out? No, I want to. It's oh, movie. you have to, because it's that that whole story. I don't want to make a spoil no spoiler alert, but that's... Um, that's a um, wonderful, wonderful story. Um, we, we froze a little bit, so sorry about that, but the audio will be kind of ongoing, the, the, the video froze. But it's a wonderful story, that Inside Out, that definitely anyone dealing with that sort of um, joy versus, versus um, sadness kind of spectrum and anger kind of, all those emotions, it's a really good story. But it, it's kind of that transition of, being able to still see that young, joyous gal, even in that sorrow and pain, you know, and, so, and, and you have a great support unit, which brings me to another thing. Having that tribe is so important and, and, and you're doing some stuff. I know that this will probably, this, I purposely put you on with the Valentine because I think, you know, a lot of the self-love. Um, I, I, sorry about that. It's breaking up. We'll get this edited. But a lot of the self-love stuff I have you on for. Um, yeah. Yeah, I have you on for Valentine's, Erin, because you have a lot of stuff with self-love. So we'll have to edit out a little bit of some of this, this stuff. But um, I thought that was a good time to have this episode kind of come out. And something that you're doing is having these little collective, I, uh, collectives I see with your, with your organization of, of being able to have these talks start these conversations. Yeah. Yeah. So next week I'm hosting my first one. It's going to be a pelvic health soiree. Um, and I'm so excited. We have pelvic floor physical therapists, women's health physicians, a doula, massage therapists, talk therapists, pelvic pain researchers, and just a bunch of young women, new moms. Some of my girlfriends are coming. And we're going to have wine and yoga, and it's not going to be scary or weird or any of that. It's just going to be, this is normal to talk about our bodies and to just get together and have that sisterhood and start to develop a familiarity with talking about this stuff. I mean, I'm not going to drag everyone in the deep end. <laughs> right. <laughs> and you might not necessarily bring out the pelvic floor model. No. <laughs> <laughs> introductory familiarity so that a woman in her mid-30s isn't asking where her vulva is and I mean I have girlfriends who are new moms and they tell me oh my organs are falling out of me or oh sex is so painful and I think that they think it's normal 
And I want to start talking about these things because I thought my pain was normal for a long time. I told one doctor, he said, do you have pain with sex? And I said, just the normal amount. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we aren't really taught that that's not normal. Right. So I think as women, part of owning our bodies is learning how they're supposed to function. Um, we know it's not normal to have a headache. I mean, you know, every time <laughs> you drink lemonade right. or something. But <laughs> right. Although it's becoming normal to people. Sometimes yeah. people are saying it's normal. You know, I, I, I have a 17 year old daughter and I have conversations, you know, one of another reason why I kind of wanted to do these conversations with like different ages and stages is because these girls in her group, in her tribe, they kind of think it's normal. They think the very dysfunctional menstrual cycles because of all the hormones and, you know, I'm a big advocate. I love the, the beauty counter brand and this and that to make it easy and it works because a lot of products are taking things out and then it doesn't work. But because like, it's, it's all that, it's years of all that and they think it's normal, horrible periods. Um, uh, you know, of course, with the normal everyday teen, you know, women with the dieting and the this and the, and the and the stuff like that, the sleep patterns now with the cell phones and being on and changing your pituitary and all of this stuff, their moms don't know. And even um, they're addicted to the same sort of stuff because it becomes the norm and they're popping the Advils and they're doing it the, and they do. I, I'm, I'm really nervous that if we don't start these conversations um, coming from the wisdom of our 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s to talk to these girls what is normal, they're going to just be where they're the doctors, they're the nurses, they're the, the lawyers and this and that, making this insane, you know, we already see it, we, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's awesome. And, and so, so, so important. Flipping that other question in that sort of spectrum, what about like, what the, what, the wise matriarch, you know, moving, let's say 20 years from now, what's, sh what's she got to say looking back to you right now? <laughs> well, I hope that, I hope that the young woman I'll have impacted will be my age at that point. Um, and I hope that some of these returns will be visible. I hope that mm. we'll see more open conversations about this stuff. Um, I'm on the advisory board for a nonprofit, formerly the Women's Health Foundation, but now they're oriented towards younger women. And they're creating an app for like 10 to 14 year old girls to get them used to their pelvic floor and like oh, that'll be awesome. their pee to make sure that they're drinking enough water. And like that, the girls that use that will be my age in 20 years. And so I really hope that we can continue to build on things like that and keep up with the times in a way that will work for the young women who continue to emerge. But um, yeah, I really hope that there's just more comfort and among my own friends of my own age group, I hope there's more comfort with seeking help when they need it. Mm. It seems like there's so much unnecessary suffering. Definitely. So, um, not, you know, we tend to self-impose a lot of suffering. We, we, were, we're, we are the more feely natured um, gender to, to a good reason because that's human. <laughs> You know, and we can teach our sons and, and, you know, that's another story. I, you know, I talk a lot about the women, but these women do birth the sons that then become the men who relate to, you know, uh, their, their families, their own families. And yes, we do live in a world where there are more CEO men. So we need them to be welcoming the CEO women. And I, um, you know, I love the quote by, um, you know, Cheryl, what is Sheryl Sandberg it, from Facebook, how she said it, the world would be a better place in a recent commencement speech if like 50% of the men were comfortable being home and like 50% more women were like CEOs of companies because we all understand them. And I, I very much think that like if we can teach our next generation, um, that's that, that scenario where, where if things go down, the men feel just as comfortable staying at home or doing more of the more quote unquote domestic things of, of, of putting the foundations. Cause you know what? It is nice when you have dinner after a long day coming home. 
okay? I'm not gonna say it's not nice. It's nice when your house is clean when you come home. But, you know, having enough men that be like, if it has to be me now, babe, you know, or any partnership, right? Of having that, I, I often hear that like, you know, women who have wives, it's like a great scenario because like they get it. <laughs> you know? they, they get that. And, um, you know, and then also the same thing with the women going into the workforce, feeling very much comfortable being their old lady boss, sassy self when they have to. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're blending that, you know, nicely. But unfortunately now we have to be the ones we make our own practices. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe one day you get to work out of school at that great place. Right. Yeah. You know, and you don't have to have that burden, but that's where we are now. Um, so I, I want to tell everybody about, I think your most recent blog post on, on your, on your site is really, really great. And I don't know, we have a couple minutes if you want to go a little bit into that or whatever, but um, you know, you bring up a really good point that I think is also important is that non-visible disability and being oh, yeah. sensitive to that. Because oh, yeah. my daughter suffers from anxiety. I've gone that route. I think I, I started with, a, I used a shtanga to, to deal with uh, panic attacks. As crazy as that sounds, <laughs> it kind of got me into using things therapeutically because of the effectiveness and recovery work with orthopedic with me wasn't the only thing that it brought me to yoga. Um, so I, I know you were talking about that. You have a, you have a, um, a dog that kind of brought it to the attention during your recent travels. Yeah. So I had pain for years and years. And for a lot of that, I was living in New Mexico, which didn't have a ton of pelvic health care. So I was flying weekly to Denver and I was flying up there on a Thursday, you know, renting a car, driving to Boulder, um, getting PT for a couple hours, wow. checking into a hotel. Shouldn't be that hard. Should not be that hard. Oh, sorry. Getting up the next morning, getting nerve blocks, um, and then getting more PT and then flying home. So I was getting really aggressive PT treatments, like skin rolling and stuff, and would be so bruised and red, oh. my skin would be hot, and I like couldn't get comfortable laying on the bed. And my dog, I mean, I would be sobbing in pain. I was on 12 medications at this point. Wow. I was a wreck. And putting my hand on my dog's chest steadied my breathing. And that companionship was as effective, more effective. <laughs> I correct myself, much more effective than any of those 12 medications that weren't doing anything and the treatment I was receiving. Um, so my doctor prescribed him as my emotional support animal. Mm. Um, I was not always able to take him with me because this was expensive. As you might imagine, I have 60,000 in medical debt. I'm right. still paying off. And this allowed me the flexibility to bring him into hotels that maybe wouldn't allow dogs to let me bring him on the plane, all this stuff. And the way that he helped me recover was invaluable. Um, my physical therapist, Sandy knows Crosby. I mean, he's just been part of my recovery. So Some of my first ventures outside the house, which is really scary after I've been in a wheelchair walking for the of first course. time, was with him. And so when I sat down on the sidewalk in pain, I could hold on to him and it was comforting and helped regulate my breathing. And what I was writing about in the blog post was how vicious people are when you're out in public and they don't see a disability. So traveling, people would say, oh, are you really even disabled? Oh, I have a quote unquote emotional support animal at home. I didn't know that was a way to get them on the plane for free. And just right. like brutal and sticker. insensitive that gets right at that, your yeah. insecurities, you know, you're already questioning yourself for years. Is this really like, what is this going on? I don't see it. Yeah. I just exactly. feel a lot of that. Yeah. And I, what I wrote about in the blog post too, was I'm getting out of the, one day I was so brave and I drove to the grocery store to do grocery shopping and I was so proud of myself and I had a short list and I'm like, okay, if I park in the disabled spot and I had a placard, um, then I can go in, I can get some produce and there's a check stand right there and I can get back out. And how awesome will that be if I can do this? So I park and I get out of my spot or I get out of my car and this man starts yelling at me. You're not even disabled. What are you doing parking there? 
And I just, for the first time, and I am a really low key person, I turned around and yelled at him, you have no idea what you're talking about. And I turned and walked away. And it's one of those things where then you start shaking a little of bit. Of course, yeah. You're humiliated and you never behave like that. And it just so exemplified the defensiveness I felt about, no, I am sick. And when you pair that with your doctor saying, maybe you should see a psychiatrist because I don't see anything wrong. Um, it's a really scary world where you don't feel right. And to a very extreme degree, and everyone's telling you, you don't look sick, you look fine. I don't think anything's wrong with you. I mean, it's so invalidating and horrifying. Right, the invalidation, because your significance gets challenged yeah. constantly by yourself and, and, and then mirrored into the world. So it, it is extremely, and that brings up a good point in terms of um, you know, uh, needing the conversation in um, healthcare to you know spend the time that's the thing that's been cut the most is is the time and it's not that you uh you should be that good i always tell kind of professionals especially when working with little people who want a cash base and we're, we're a little bit different out of the box it's not that you need an hour with a client it's that you should be so good to use that hour well like you should you know you should be so good clinically get your letters to be so good clinically that in 45 minutes you can spend 30 talking to them and still accomplish stuff in 15. Yeah. Because that's where a lot of people get lost. They don't ask, find that other person. I mean, especially when you're dealing with persistent pain and, and lady part areas. I mean, you're, you might have to go 10, 15 years maybe. I've heard, I had a story. Yeah. And um, you need to keep on being able to talk and, and have that validated. So that is, you know, coming from the, the client or patient's perspective, you know, thank you for sharing that because it's me saying it and like, oh yeah, you know, in your nice little world of whatever you do, but it's not, it's necessary. That's what quality management is. It's, I mean, you're the lawyer, you know, risk, it's going to be a lot less risk, right? If you have that conversation with people than if you're looking at your thing, doing this and then miss something. And then they feel like they went home with the wrong information and then they're going to sue you. <laughs> yeah, well, if you're nice, <laughs> actually, you're at much less risk of being sued. There you go. I mean, you know, there's probably, let's do an evidence-based uh, study yeah. on that because it's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, like, the relationship is so important. And I've seen providers who are really worried about keeping their own boundaries up around their own life. To be professional, right? Yeah. And I think that especially when you're talking about persistent pain, especially when you're talking about very feminine oriented pain disorders or post childbirth issues and stuff like that. I think that you can let down those walls without making yourself vulnerable. And that if you're putting up these walls to survive your day at the clinic, then maybe something else in your life needs to be adjusted because mm -hmm. Until I had providers who were willing to connect with me, I didn't feel at home in their clinic. Um, a quick story about Sandy, who, I mean, is a- And that's Sandy Hilton for anybody here in the Sandy. <laughs> Great, go check her out. Wonderful human being. And I had, um, about a year and a half ago, I was there for, I was at her clinic for yoga. Her business partner, mm -hmm. Sarah Haig, teaches yoga. And right before yoga started, my phone rang and I answered it. And it was my doctor saying that a recent breast MRI showed a lump. Now my mother had breast cancer at 42. So I like collapsed on the floor and was worse. And Sandy came over and I was not there to see her. And she sat on the floor next to me and she rubbed my hair and was like, you are going to be fine. And I mean, that was her instinct. Um, but she didn't say, oh, I'm her provider and I probably shouldn't get involved in this. Right. This no. is too, this is white coat. <laughs> yeah. It just was a natural response. She was and, being human. It's that yeah. human quality um, that is professional. Knowing how to play that and not necessarily get lost in your patient's pain or your client's pain. Right. Um, and not letting them victimize themselves to the extent that, you know, you feel guilty for not spending, right. you know, more time or cutting down your fees or whatever. Yeah. But that's what being going from amateur to professional is. 
Yeah. And she know? is the utmost professional. We have a very, I'd say, clear relationship. But at the same time, we have a relationship. And that makes me trust her, which makes it so that while she's treating me, my body can relax because she's, she's got this. And mm -hmm. because we've built a relationship, I know about her background. I know about her experience. I trust her with my body. Mm -hmm. I, think that I do the same thing with, I'll have people come in to my law firm and I'll say, here's my history. I had pelvic pain. That's why I'm passionate about creating patient-centered practices. And some people are kind of like, whoa, too much information. But I find it really important to saying, this is where I come from. And I think that I can help you because of this. Mm. Because otherwise, why, why should they trust me? I mean, where's my responsibility to reassure them and provide them with evidence of my ability to help them? Not just the degrees on the wall, but the... Right. Right, because there's other people with those same degrees. And I think yeah. that connecting with the right person at whatever pro professional level, whatever job, is yeah. you're going to get what you need better. So thank Absolutely. you. Thank yeah. you. And so being willing to admit that we're not all the professional for everyone. Right. Being able to say, you know, I'm really, really awesome for some people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Love that. So well, I will finish with that. Where can we find you? What's the best places to find you nowadays when we want to both on the law side, because I think a lot of the healthcare providers will be looking you up. I know I just sent one, um, one of the women I mentor to your website. Um, so where can we find you there? And then also on this other organization that sounds so great. On the legal side, you can find me at jackson-legal.com. Um, Jackson LLP is my law firm, and my law partner is my husband, so you'll More see him well. And my nonprofit, Inspire Sante, is inspiresante.org. Um, and I'll give you those links. Yeah, you'll give me the link. I'll put them in the in the show notes and everything. Well, thank you so much, Erin. This has been wonderful. We went a little bit longer for those that were listening on here, but I think it was an important, really important story, and I'm really excited, and I know that because, um, you know, I know we'll be having other conversations. Hopefully, we'll meet in person one day in, in yeah. the same presence. Um, but thank you so much for your work and your story. This is another episode of Owning Her Health. Thanks so much, guys. Talk to you soon. Thank you for listening into this episode of Owning Her Health with Dr. Lisa Holland, PT. To learn more about her personal and professional development service, visit her online at drlisahollandpt.com.